camera. No. no, 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 no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Tonight, scathing WhatsApps and bath-mouthing Boris, Dominic Cummings shows his true colours at the COVID inquiry. Westminster under scrutiny over misogyny and abuse allegations. Labour MP Stella Creasy will tell us why some politicians think they can get away with it. And I'll tell you why I'm exposing the shadowy number 10 fixer at the heart of the Conservative Party. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. This week, the COVID inquiry dominated headlines, with former aide to Boris Johnson, Dominic Cummings, foul-mouthed rant making the front pages of nearly every newspaper. I'm sure Dominic Cummings thought that he would come out of this evidence session with the illusion that he's a great strategist still intact, but he didn't. In fact, the case examining him filleted him like a kipper. Cummings appeared to be a bully and a misogynist, no better than a potty mouth thug. He did what he always does, created light and heat and noise, but at no time during that hearing did we hear about what Dominic Cummings had ever done or achieved during his time in number 10. No wonder Boris Johnson sacked him. It was a mix of a lot of the wrong people in the wrong job, uh, um, decades of accumulated power, no real scrutiny and insight, a culture of... Um, constantly classifying everything to uh, hide mistakes and um, hide scrutiny. So many senior figures that didn't know who, who on earth was in charge of what. He's hailed as the man who delivered Brexit, but did he? He's credited as having won Johnson the 2019 general election, but he didn't. He was barely seen by anyone during the campaign. What we saw at the COVID inquiry was the first stage of the Cum Cummings bubble beginning to burst. And I can promise you that there is much more to come. Here to go through all of that with me tonight are my panel. I'm joined by James Schneider, the Momentum co-founder and former communications director to Jeremy Corbyn. Welcome, James. And next to him, the commentator and founder of Conservative Home, Tim Montgomery. Tim, how damaging was the COVID inquiry session to Dominic Cummings this week, do you think? I think it was very, very damaging, actually. And some people have focused on the swearing etc and think well, it's not an issue everyone swears now but actually I think a lot of people don't swear I think a lot of core conservative voters were very offended by it and what it said though what it illustrated was what was the environment in number 10 during the time Dominic Cummings was there it was nasty it was misogynistic as you've already said there was a level of distrust therefore generated in that very macho uh, frat pack culture which meant that at a time when we needed everyone in Downing Street to be at their best, coming up with ideas, not afraid to give their opinions, to challenge conventional wisdom, people were afraid of that sort of nasty backlash that they could have got from that sort of culture. And I think in incredibly vivid, too vivid form, I think that was revealed in very stark form. So, James, you know, everyone's seen in the thick of it and all the thick of it, and everybody's had this kind of, like, joke, kind of um, humorous impression of that darker side of Westminster, but actually the reality is much worse. And, and it doesn't matter. I, I know that in all, you know, I've worked in Westminster for 25 years. I was stunned when I first arrived at the language. I've kind of become accustomed to it now. It's in all political parties. But this was different because I think people expect at the heart of number 10 and with a party which is running the country and in what is the engine room of the of the government, for there to be standards of behaviour and professionalism. And we didn't see any of that in the inquiry, did we? SW1. Well, let's take a listen. Let's just listen to his evidence. You called ministers useless pigs, morons, 
in emails and WhatsApps to your professional colleagues. Do you think you contributed to a lack of effectiveness on the part of ministers and of the Cabinet? No, I think I was reflecting a widespread view uh, amongst uh, competent people. Well, actually, that was probably the widespread view amongst competent people, actually, of Dominic Cummings, because the entire time he was in Number 10, he was, I think the word I'd use was, and the word I heard use, was a menace. But James, do you think that having somebody who behaved like Dominic Cummings in Number 10 has let the voters down? I find this focus on Dominic Cummings' language and supposed personal conduct, frankly, quite weird and illustrative of what is wrong, uh, in part illustrative of what is wrong with Westminster and how our media covers Westminster. I don't really care about Dominic Cummings, the person. He clearly has bad language and so on and so forth. But the inquiry is meant to find out why... But James, don't you hold care on, on, about on. bullying cultures? No, hold on, hold on, wait. The inquiry isn't into bullying cultures in number 10. The inquiry is into how we were so terribly let down in COVID. And that is what happened in our country. And that is what some of the inquiry has shown. And I think it shows, and I, frankly, also our media at the time was uh, embarrassed itself with um, the way in which it engaged with COVID in those first few months. So I think it is not surprising, but nevertheless still shocking that the way in which our political media class engages with this evidence is to say, oh my goodness, look how horrible this horrible behaviour is, rather than looking at what are the actual failings and how can we improve things again? But, but That's that, what the inquiry you're, is you're, meant you're to be about. You're missing the thing, though. They're directly related. The behaviour in Downing Street, the indefensible behaviour by people like Dominic Cummings, was why decisions were so, partly so poor. There's all that, there are other explanations, which you're right, the inquiry must get at, but it was that bullying culture which stopped civil servants and other advisers saying what needed to be said. There was a climate of fear that Dominic Cummings was promoting. You can't detach them. Uh, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, look, I wasn't there and I'm in no way a spokesperson for the people that, no. were, the, 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 that were there, quite the contrary. But it seems to me that the level of failures that we had in COVID firstly stretched back far beyond when that group of people happened sure. to... Uh, happened, I'm not saying it's the only wait, wait, problem. Ha ha happened, ..happened to come together and to fix all of the, some of the absolutely woeful uh, decision-making on the basis that people okay, weren't so able James, to, to, I, to James, to, I have to, to jump up. in here, because you're spreading a narrative that everything was woeful that happened during COVID. I served as a health minister for two years. I can tell you it wasn't. And the thing that interests me, actually, a great deal about the COVID inquiry, put Dominic Cummings to one side and, and the rest of it, was, and the KC is doing an excellent job, but it's really interesting the way the questioning is directed towards getting the highlights of negativity. And maybe we blame social media for that. Maybe we blame the media. I don't know. But, the, but I think everybody's beginning to notice that the, the line of questioning is too illicit. Just, just what we saw, even the KC himself saying the swear words in full. You know, we've seen the kind of like playing to the gallery element of this as well. Yeah. But, you know, we were the first country to have a vaccine. We were the first country not to, to come out almost completely of restrictions across Europe and across the greater world. We were making huge progress. We were economically, and well, it's been wasted since, but one of the best set situations economically well, coming out of COVID. Well, it was not all woeful. Okay, well, there are elements that were lacking that could have been a lot better. And that's what the inquiry is supposed to do, to find out what they were, to right. prevent it happening in the future. But this narrative that this country managed COVID badly, that we, we performed poorly, that we let people down, that we created deaths, just isn't true. Okay. We were the first to vaccinate. There would have been a lot more deaths if we hadn't been. OK. Now, regardless of whether you think that we handled things well or badly, were well or badly prepared and ready for it, I think the balance of evidence suggests more on the negative side, but, you know, I accept their different difference of, of opinions. The purpose of having the inquiry is to get to the bottom of that, to see what could be improved and how. It isn't really, I don't think, for the KC to focus on, you know, the bad language in uh, in WhatsApps or the media to put that on the front page and suggest that this is all about personalities. I don't think it is all about personalities. I mean, there are there are you know, clearly 
things that we should be looking at, for example, the, the chicken pox parties thing, the, the, how the uh, policy changed on herd immunity. And these are important things from a basic public policy perspective, which if we were being serious, if SW1 were a serious place, which it completely isn't, as you, uh, of course, agree, and if our media were serious, which it isn't, which again, of course, you agree, would be the things that we'd be looking at. But that's, not me say, that's not the, me the, saying the, that he didn't swear. Of the, course the, he swore. The inquiry is looking at those things, though. We're just talking is about... Exactly the, what it's there for. We're Make talking sure about the Dominic Cummings evidence today. You can't say, you know, he's not looking at those things. The inquiry is looking at other things. The media but, hasn't but, covered but, but James, the media what you're trying to do... But, but what the media, you're hasn't, to the media do. hasn't been looking at the substance of what he said. OK, that you, you, you should be able to look at both. I, I, I agree. There's, there's, I'm sure there's a case that could be made and it should be balanced on, on the evidence of judgment that his personal management style had a deleterious effect. That's entirely possible. That James, should be you're looked minimizing, at. you're minimising the relevance and the importance of the culture and the bad behaviour and the misogyny which Dominic Cummings created at the heart of Number 10, the engine room driving us through COVID. You're minimising both the effect and the impact of that behaviour by you're trying to say, well, it doesn't really matter. It's a bit weird talking about that. You need to look at these things that the government got wrong. Tim's right. They are related. But what you're doing, James, is minimising what Dominic Cummings... And I don't think you can get away with that. I don't think you can do that. I mean, I'm, I'm not minimising his role, although, of course, I think that structures are, in general terms, more important than individuals. What I'm saying is, from what I saw of his evidence, he says, uh, you know, Whitehall and, uh, and our, our governing class don't work, the, and the relationship with the media doesn't work, it is short-termist, it, uh, it doesn't take forward things from the outside, it doesn't build good teams, it's got groupthink, etc., etc., all things which, I think, broadly speaking, are true and then the response that we see to his uh, evidence from our political class and from the media basically repeats that now that's not me defending him okay, i'm so not James, defending him at why, would, why would i i don't i don't have in any way similar politics or position but i think that our, our media and political class is woefully inept at, at, at supporting okay. the country. And this is just another example of that. So we've got to move on to talk about uh, the protest and, and what's happening in the wider world. But what I will say is what we've heard is just the evidence of a small number of people at the COVID inquiry this week. There are many, many people to come forward yet. Many, many people who've submitted evidence. And the picture which may emerge is not the one that including you paint. Including Boris we, Johnson himself. Yeah, mm. including. And Simon Case, where is the cabinet secretary? Oh, yes, he's not around, is he? But yes, there are lots of people You're being a yet. little bit cynical about that illness. Um, no, I'm not. And, and, you know, I don't wish ill on anybody. And I hope, seriously, hope he isn't poorly. But, um, yeah, there are lots of people who have got to give evidence yet. So um, we are going to move on now to Keir Starmer. And so, James, I'm going to come to you on the tricky issue that he's found himself, or position he's found himself this week over the ceasefire. Where do you think he's gone wrong here? Has he got it right? What's going on? Because, you know, I, I said in the show a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, let's hope Keir Starmer holds the line on the ceasefire. And do you see that weakening? So Keir Starmer's approach to this is been to take the traditional approach of the Labour Party in opposition, which is to tuck in behind the government, which then in turn tucks in behind the US. And he has faithfully carried that out. Now, the reason why he has difficulty is because the overwhelming majority of people in the country don't support that policy. I think there was a YouGov poll, 8% of people oppose a ceasefire. So he is understandably coming under a tremendous amount of pressure because many of his MPs are coming under a tremendous amount of pressure from members of the public because the public overwhelmingly wants a ceasefire because it's plain common sense that you don't respond to one set of killings by killing many, many more people. It isn't going to bring about any peace and it is creating... James, there is no war, it is no creating war ever where civilians have not, sadly, and just absolutely desperately become, have been, become the victims of that war. We bombed here, us, Britain, I think we... We, when the bombing of Dresden, when Dresden was raised during the Second World War, I think we killed, what, was it 1.5 million people, 2 million people? Vi civilians become the, the victims These, of war the, and the victims of the, in this case, 
of the actions of Hamas. So he, we can't get to they're Hamas. Not, they're not the victims of the actions of Hamas. Hamas is not flying the, M, the F-16 supplied by the US. No, and they're not. They, they, they crossed on, the border on, into Israel uh, and murdered 1,400 people with their bare hands. And drop, well, not with their bare hands, but they're not dropping the I'm bombs. I'm sorry, with knives on, held in not, their bare they're hands. Not, they're not dropping the bombs on Gaza. We have had nearly 4,000 children killed more than half of the buildings and it's desperate more than half of the buildings in gaza have been raised to rubble because hamas there are is, hiding in those buildings i also think we need to be careful about repeating everything hamas says in terms yeah. of casualties exactly. far too many people have died far too much destruction has been done but it isn't all about what hamas's health authority says i'm i'm i'm, I'm sorry but i mean you think that these people's names are not real you think Sarah Mohammed Suleiman Al Astal, 17 years old, not real. No, did I, did, no, Ahmed no, Khalid Jim, did I say that those were that's not real? Casualty, you, named, you, you gave a figure of 4,000 and just accepted it was right. That, uh, that number comes from Hamas, a terrorist group. You, were, you are comes... skeptical about everything Israel does and no, says, sorry. but when Hamas says something, you believe it. No. That's what we're complaining about. We're not saying no one has died. Tim, we're all outraged by Tim, the loss but, of innocent but Tim, life. But, but, Tim... I'm sorry, James, you're but, uh, no, 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 no. ganging up on you because we're both... Yes, I, and, but just please let me make this point because it's really quite important yeah. about, the, about the deaths, right? The, the names of the civilians who have been killed have been released by the health authority in Gaza have been identified... Controlled by Hamas. Oh, please let me finish... Sorry. Please let me finish the point. But they are controlled by Hamas. Please right? let me finish the point, because, uh, as we're saying, we're talking about dead children. So let me finish the point. But you have to complete let, the point. Oh, you have I, to... I would have done if you hadn't interrupted me on it twice. Now, they are being identified by the Israeli-issued identity numbers. This is... The, 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 it, it is a unbelievable thing to say that these are not real, that these deaths are made up. And it is, it, it, it is completely wrong. We you, know You that. are now misrepresenting my position. So you can't really complain about other people misrepresenting you when, you when I was absolutely clear, people have clearly died. I'm just questioning the scale and the number of Hamas and I'm, casualties. And I'm, because Hamas are a terrorist group Palestinian that you casualties. seem to give an awful lot more credence Pal to than the country of Israel, which is a democracy, Palestin where it has Supreme Court, which has legal process. Hamas intimidates everyone that operates Palis in the Gaza Strip. Palestinian casualties, not Hamas casualties, and they have they have been Hamas casualty figures. They have been named and identified by their Israeli issued some of them identity have, numbers. Some of those numbers have been recycled. In, so you aren't quoting. So sorry, I have, to, I have to make a point. They are uh, those figures are issued by the Gaza Health Authority, which is controlled by Hamas. That is an important point to make. Well, that's a factual point, yes. And one that you failed to make. So, what do you mean, one that I've... So, no, when you, you said the, the figures were issued by the Gaza Health Authority... They are issued by the Gaza Health Authority. By the Hamas. Gaza Health Authority... Controlled which... by Hamas. Yes, but when I say... It has, the most, it has actually a very impressive propaganda but machine, Nadine, as we saw in the first few days. Nadine, when I say the Israeli state, I don't say the Likud-led far-right government of the Israeli state. But it's state. very different when you're Israeli talking state. about... No, because the Israeli state is not led by a terrorist organisation. Well, the Israeli is state is carrying, that that is, is carrying out extreme war crimes at so James, present James. And, its, and its leaders have been speaking with genocidal language. So, James. So, it, so, so if we seek truth from facts, let's do that. Though, uh, those are the things let's that are going clear. on. Well, look, there well, are some... you make your points, but can I just... Do, do, you, do you believe that as a result of Hamas actions, as a result of their actions crossing the border into Israel, and murdering 1,400 people, and you say not with their bare hands, but holding knives and with guns, the most barbaric acts that they committed when they crossed the border. Do you believe that if Israel now... What do you think would happen if Israel were to say now, OK, ceasefire, we are laying down our arms? I'll tell you what would happen. There would be another Holocaust. That's what would happen. No, what do you I'm think? Nadine. What do you think Hamas would do if that was the situation? <sighs> Israel has to defend N itself. Nadine... Okay. And do you N think they Nadine, can do that with okay, no casualties? Okay, Nadine, please don't say there'd be another Holocaust because you are conjuring up enormous fears, enormous understandable fears in Jewish people who have that absolute 
horror, that industrial slaughter, that industrial scale genocide. James, it's been reported so, they put babies so, in ovens. That's as close to the Holocaust as you can get. It's been reported that Hamas terrorists put Israeli okay, babies in ovens. Okay, we're, and I've I've also seen that somewhere else debunked, but I'm not going to get into the, the get into the specifics of the claim. I'll come back to your central point. What should a statesperson-like leader of Israel do in response to the events of the 7th of October? First, they should... Okay, we're going to have to move on because we have to go into the break. So, so if you just get... Because I'm listening to you. I'm, I'm not trying to cut you short, but mm -hmm. if you can... So first, they should have reinforced the uh, the kibbutz in, uh, in the Negev bordering Gaza. They Part of the reason they're not enough troops there to defend is because they're in the West Bank overseeing the ethnic True. cleansing of Palestinians there. And then the next thing to do is to sue for peace. And I know that sounds extremely difficult after horrible things are done, and it is extremely difficult. But the only long-term solution to this conflict is to end the dispossession of the Palestinian people and to have some form of settlement with all the Palestinian and all the Israeli political, political parties. That would lead to fewer deaths, both Palestinian and Israeli, in the short, medium and long term. James, we've got to go to break, but the two-state solution has been on the table for a very long time. The and people who won't sign up to it are Hamas. Uh, absolute so nonsense. Coming a, up, a historical It would have nonsense. been in place if a, Hamas had agreed to it. A his, no, coming that up, is, I'm sorry, that is After a week nonsense. of Boris Johnson's... Oh, we're having a lively time here today. After a week of Boris Johnson's advisers queuing up to plunge their knives into him, our speech's biographer, Andrew Gibson, about his time in number 10.
Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. On Tuesday, the COVID inquiry heard evidence from two of Boris Johnson's key advisers at the height of the pandemic, Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane. Through their unearthed WhatsApp exchanges and testimonies, they painted a picture of complete chaos within Number 10 at the height of the pandemic. And more often than not, when it came to finding someone to blame, their fingers pointed to Boris Johnson. But did their testimonies really tell the whole story of Boris's handling of the crisis? To get to the bottom of it is Andrew Jimson, author of acclaimed biography of Boris Johnson, The Rise of Boris Johnson. So, Andrew, welcome. Lovely to see you. Nice to move on to something a bit lighter than um, Palestine. Um, so, I'm going to ask you your thoughts on uh, what happened to the COVID inquiry last week. Do you think Boris Johnson should have got rid of Dominic Cummings a bit earlier? Yes, he should. He needed Cummings until the general election of December 2019. He needed Cummings f for Brexit. But once that had happened, Boris stopped being the insurgent. He was no longer the rebel. And Cummings is a nat another natural rebel. Uh, and once you're in charge of the whole machine, in the whole government machine in Whitehall, you have to be like becoming a commander of regular troops. You can't just do hit and run raids and then melt away into the mountains. You're there. You take the ultimate responsibility. And Cummings, with his ability, I mean, obviously a man of enormous ability, but unfortunately one of his abilities is, is, is to pick quarrels with just about everyone. And he's particularly rude about Conservative MPs, many of whom, of course, are very irritating people. But nevertheless, they're the people in the end who can sack the Conservative leader. So it is very important to... to you just revealed something that's in... Um, oh, so I'm ha. not sure I'm allowed to mention this, but you probably could, Andrew. Ha. Ha. But um, his rudeness to uh, Conservative MPs, his yes. rudeness about every Conservative MP yes. is kind of like off the scale. The language we saw at the COVID inquiry last week, I mean, he's been using that language about Conservative MPs Always. It's nothing new. You're quite right. It's he has. nothing he new. Has. He's, not a, he's not a parliamentary person at all. Well, I can uh, tell you something. Hero, MPs don't like him much either. No. And his hero, or one of his heroes, he has several heroes, one of his heroes is Bismarck. And Bismarck, of course, had contempt, really, for parliamentary politics. I mean, he could manipulate parliamentarians, but he believed that blood and iron were what decided things, not, not resolutions. And, and... See, Andrew, I don't think he believes anything. Oh. I think it's all fabricated. And, you know, when you said that... Because, you know, one of the points I made before you came in was um, into the studio was we heard nothing about what Dominic Cummings actually achieved or what he did. And I think there's a lot of heat and a lot of light and a lot of noise around him. You know, he takes credit for being a political strategist for the general election. He was nowhere to be seen. He had no involvement in the general election of 2019 campaign at all, whatsoever. And I've had this from many people. No one saw Dominic Cummings. And I think, I think he's created via his rudeness and his attitude and the perception that he builds of others around this attitude that he has. He's built up this kind of aura of this, this great strategist and campaigner. And I think his bubble's beginning to burst because people are asking, excuse me, what did you actually do? Apart from blame everybody, swear at everybody, shout to everybody, be disorganised, break things down, build nothing up. What did you actually do? Can you tell me something that he actually did? I think it was Patrick Vallance who had the idea of the vaccine task force. Um, but I think Cummings did back that and, and Boris, within about three seconds, saw that that was a good idea. No, so it was the, Kate the, Bingham, actually. Well, well, Kate Bingham did it, yes. But, and it was Boris who uh, brought yes. Kate Bingham Well, I think, I think Patrick Vallance knew her already because he had worked in the, in the, in the yeah. drugs. So drug... Boris and Patrick both knew yes. her. Yes. But can I just tell you that you may not remember at the time, but mm. as soon as Kate Bingham was appointed, there was this huge amount of leaking into the press, negative briefings. Yes. Who do you think was doing all that negative briefing against Kate Bingham? Yes, well, it was very bad. Some of it was coming from... Well, where 10. do you think it might have been coming from? <laughs> so this is what I it mean. Was, it was very, this, very... The yes, one thing yes. that Dominic Cummings did do well was brief and leak constantly to journalists. Now, I'm still waiting for someone to tell me... See, that, that, so the, uh, the example you've just given me is one that has been this perception that is put out there. But, you know, it isn't actually the whole perception. Why do you think Boris Johnson stood by him when the whole Barnard Castle thing blew up? Because Boris was at the... A pinnacle. He was more popular after. Why do you think? No. Oh, I'll ask you I that. think he's loyal, and I think he doesn't like being pushed around by the media. 
Uh, um, and he, he did the same thing sometimes when he was at City Hall. He stood by people where the conventional wisdom was so-and-so is a goner and embarrassment, you must get rid of him. Uh, and the conventional opinion would, would have been, you know, get rid of Cummings now, it's a perfect chance. But Boris didn't. Uh, and that loyalty was not, not, not very well repaid. So you know what, the last cabinet meeting that we had with Boris, it was really interesting because um, there was, you know, the usual, you know, goodbyes. And it was a very sad meeting, actually. And one cabinet secretary, and I won't name, said, the problem is, uh, Prime Minister, you're kind, but you've been too kind. You're nice, but you've been too nice. And you're loyal, but you've been too loyal. And I think that was the first moment for me that mm. it actually crystallised that, yes, he is incredibly loyal to people that yes. maybe other people would not be so loyal to him. For me, the next question is why? Why is he so loyal? And that's a difficult one for me because I'm a loyal animal myself, so I find that one difficult to answer. Yes, it's a kind of affection, isn't it? And actually, it's a Tory thing as well. He's very loyal to institutions that he's belonged to. Anything that he's ever belonged to, he very much is sort of body and soul in that institution. Which Whether is, it's Eton or, or Oxford Eton or Oxford, or... the Bullingdon Club, he'll... he'll, he'll um, Where well, did you find the Bullingdon Club? While, while, while David Cameron tries to downplay it and, you know, the photographs were mysteriously suppressed of Cameron in the Bullingdon Club, Boris would greet someone like David Dimbleby and, you know, start shouting sort of wild, barbaric, buller cries. <laughs> um, so ev ev it's everything he's ever belonged to, he thinks, is, is a very good thing. Well, do you know what, Andrew? I think that's a good quality. Yes. I think that's yes. a quality that, that can sustain people through life. I like that quality. So, Andrew, our time has gone so fast. I don't feel like we've said anything. No. But oh. thank you so <laughs> much for coming. Thank you for having and, me. And um, I wish I'd gone to talk to you about a year ago. Ah, so. well... Andrew wrote the, as I said at the beginning, the, uh, the, has written his own book on Boris Johnson. Love to see you. Thank Love you very much. Love to see you. Thank you for having me. OK, so coming up, I'll be speaking to Labour's Stella Creasy about the culture of misogyny, plaguing Westminster and what needs to be done to fix it for good. Everybody. I hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am fans. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem solved. solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Three here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after <laughs> this show. <laughs> Get out. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, no, no. no, no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. 
How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question. You answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. For some time, female politicians have fought to expose a sickening abuse of power exercised by some politicians and advisers in Westminster. But this apparent merry-go-round of misogyny was once again in the spotlight this week, when a myriad of foul WhatsApp messages from Dominic Cummings were revealed in the COVID inquiry. In them, he called for the former Deputy Cabinet Secretary, Helen McNamara, the C word and said he wanted to handcuff her and then remove her from the building. The things that Mr Cummings, having seen those messages, it was, you know, it's not, it's horrible to read, but it is both surprising and not surprising to me. And I don't know which is worse. Uh, it wasn't a pleasant place to work. I was doing my job as a civil servant and uh, that... I'm confident about that, and the way in which it was considered appropriate to describe what should happen to me, yes, as a woman, but yes, as a civil servant, it's been disappointing to me that the Prime Minister didn't pick him up on the use of some of that violent and misogynistic language. But was it really that much of a shock? Only last year, a poll found one in ten Westminster staffers had experienced sexual harassment. And last month, Conservative MP Peter Bone had the whip removed after bullying and harassment allegations were made against him, allegations he denies. So when Westminster became the, sewer, the sewer that it is now, how do we clean it up? One person who may have a good idea of what needs to happen is Labour MP for Walthamstow, Stella Creasy. So hi, Stella. Hello, lovely to see you. I think the last Hi, Nadine. Time How I was... are you doing on the other side? <laughs> yeah, it's great, Stella. You want to join me? Um, the last time I was with Stella, actually, I think I was chairing a committee and she was on the committee. So, Stella, um, here mm. we go again. Here we are again. So, yes. were you shocked by the language that was used and what you heard about Dominic Cummings when he was at the COVID inquiry this week? No, but I think one of the things is that we're not really shocked by the open hostility because we've seen so much of it. And we can't even deal with the open hostility to deal with the unconscious bias that means so often women's voices and the diversity of women's voices is minimised and sidelined and dismissed. And the catastrophic impact, you know, you and I, Nadine, can disagree about all sorts of things, but we've probably shared very similar experiences of having our male colleagues talk over us or demean us or suggest that we're difficult because we have different opinions to them. And that also the issues that we should both care about or be able to talk about fit into a box called lady issues. Um, it's a never ending story. The frustration for me is that it has a, such a massive impact on our constituents. So Stella, I, so I slightly disagree with you on, on some of those points because I think in recent years, we've seen changes in West. I mean, I've been there a long time. I started working there I've been an MP 18 years, so 20, what, 23 years. I've, I've seen a difference. Like we've had debates on menopause. We've had debates on um, sudden infant death. We've had, I think, I think it's changed a lot in the last 10 years to what it used to be. And more on year on year, I think you see there's the less of the taboo about talking about things in the chamber that we used to be absolutely unable to talk about in the past. So I think it's slightly better. Um, you're right about, you know, women's voices come second. That still happens. But what I want to focus on really is, you know, there are, I can't remember what the number of cases are, but I think you may be able to correct me here, Stella. Is it 56 cases of sexual harassment from MPs to, to others are being investigated at the moment? I think that's the number. Is that an extraordinary number for any workplace, don't you think? My understanding is that number is incorrect. We don't know how many cases there are. And I think we have to separate out things that should be standard in any workplace. Nobody should experience sexual harassment, abuse, bullying as a standard thing. And yet, unfortunately, what we're seeing is that's time and time again. I've been in Parliament 13 years, Nadine. You can't tell me that you think that 
we've actually got to the bottom of the people doing this. And no. sadly, it's people having to come forward to complain, which is a really difficult thing to do that is uncovering it, not our policies, our procedures that are tackling it. But I think the second thing where I, I think you and I disagree is absolutely some brilliant campaigning and cross-party campaigning to get issues that disproportionately affect women like the menopause on the agenda. But what happens is that men are not part of those conversations and they need to be. And you still get, and I've experienced a form of sexism, which is the idea that I could, for example, talk about legal loan sharking and financial regulation is found extraordinary to people because they think that women should only be talking about women's issues. Mm -hmm. And that culture, and you see it in the way, frankly, people react to Rachel Reeves as an incredibly talented and clever woman, but there's a kind of surprise almost that she can do spreadsheets. So it's both things we have to tackle. We need more women's voices, but we also need to be able to hear women on a wider range of subjects. The harassment and the bullying I see is just the top of the iceberg of the reasons why it's so hard for equal voices to be heard. And actually, I think it damages everybody. Because um, I should also say, I think there's a real problem with young men being harassed and abused and bullied in Parliament too. And sadly, I'm just not sure at the moment that we're not going to see a, a culture which is led by press reporting in tackling these issues rather than the proper procedures and policies that you'd expect in any other workplace, because this is not unique to politics. It's just that politics somehow has struggled to deal with it. So, you know, we, I, I should also say we have made progress in terms of the complaint system, which Andrew Leadsom brought in a while ago. And, and, and that system is supposed to work. I'm not sure that it does effectively. Um, Stella, I'll come back to you. Mm. I'm just going to bring in the panel for a moment. I also, I don't know, Rachel Reeves is a really good case that Stella mentioned because, you know, Stella said that, you know, people are surprised that Rachel Reeves can uh, understand a spreadsheet. Hasn't stopped Rachel Reeves getting to be shadow chancellor, though, when I think she's incredibly impressive. I think she'll make a, like George Osborne, I think she will make a bold and impressive chancellor. But it hasn't, although people are surprised that she can, it hasn't stopped her getting there. So, what do you, what's your thoughts? Tim, what do you think about the culture within Westminster? Do you well, have an opinion? I, well, I hesitate to disagree with anything that you and Stella have just said. I think there's a lot of uh, progress that still needs to be made. But there are encouraging partnerships. And Carolyn Harris, one of uh, Stella's colleagues, a Labour MP, she lost a child very early on in her life and she couldn't Michael. afford to bury him. And it, she will say that it was Ian Duncan Smith and Jacob Rees-Mogg, two Conservatives on the other side, who a lot of perhaps people watching this programme would think are typical males. They were the ones that reached out to her and helped make that legislation but happen. But that is the exception. It's the, it's, they are it is the ex exceptional it, it is, men. It is exception, but there are more and more examples of that happening. Carolyn Harris is working with the Centre for Social Justice think tank on the menopause campaign mm. now. And we men need to listen a bit more and reach out across the aisle. But there are some encouraging signs, and um, we're always painting a negative picture of politics in the media, but there are things that are better than there were, and let's sometimes you know, focus on those things as well, yeah. without without at all lessening the challenge that still lies ahead. Yeah, that's a very good point. And that's a point I tried to make to us. We are making progress. I'm just... I'm not sure how... It's too how slow. It's too slow, yeah. yeah. It's not fundamentally enough. I, James? I think I mean, part of the culture in it, there, there is an unpleasant culture in, in, in Westminster and it runs along the lines of power, which is normally gendered, but as Stella said, isn't always. There are young men that are also uh, bullied and sexually harassed. And uh, part of the problem is that MPs run their offices but many of them will have never done any management before, never run a team before, won't know how to, won't know how to do it. Um, and don't get given the training, which they, I mean, clearly, if you, the, the number of cases they keep on coming up um, and aren't given the training, they, they really should. And I think there's a, you know, there's a strong case for the, you know, the HR for MPs, basic staff being taken away from MPs collectively, not as a punishment, but um, because it should be run, some of it should be run much more like a workplace and so some of it's political. So, Stella, I've spoken to young women who mm. are in law firms and, and in the NHS, and there's a, there's a case this week, I think, on um, the website Pregnant and Then Screwed about a woman who works in the BBC. Do you think that we are attributing the behaviour in Westminster to MPs in Westminster, or do you think we're reflecting the workplace in a wider society, or it, are we unique? Well, we are unique in the fact that um, where it happens involving MPs, of course, MPs don't have any employment rights. So we don't have any protection against sexual harassment and bullying in the workplace. 
Uh, and given that some of the complaints do involve other MPs, that is quite telling. But also MPs are their own employers, but we don't actually get, I actually for once agree with James on this, that we don't get the HR support and we don't get the um, management of where you're seeing those problems. Um, so I think it's that we treat Parliament as so special and yet it's the place that makes these laws and we don't uphold the laws ourselves. That is why this is being led by complaints rather than cultures. I'll give you a very good example of this. In most workplaces, there are rules because you recognise it happens and it happens in politics. People meet people, they fall in love, they form relationships. But there's also a process by which you let HR know about it, which protects both sides of the relationship should anything happen in future. There are no rules like that in Parliament, and yet they're part of being able to protect people against sexual harassment. My concern, Nadine, is if we don't get to grips with this, somebody will rightly bring forward a case against an MP as their employer, and we won't be able to show we provided yeah. a safe yeah. workspace. That's a very, very legitimate concern. Stella, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Please come on again. Coming up, I'll tell you all about the powerful Tory known as Dr No, operating at the heart of number 10. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. Next week, I will be revealing the shocking truth about the powerful forces who operate in the shadows of Westminster and how they orchestrated Boris Johnson's downfall. Number 10 have tried to stop me, asking me to halt the publication of my book and let them see a copy first, but that's not going to happen. 
In fact, we can talk about one of the many revelations right now. The powerful Tory known as Dr. No, this shadowy fixer at the heart of number 10 was rumoured to have had a rabbit chopped up and nailed to the owner's home in a warning to his ex-girlfriend. James and Tim are still with me. James, um, that was just a teaser for the rest of the book, which came out today. But for me, it's a really shocking one, you know, as an animal lover. It's a really shocking one. What did you think? What do you make of what you've heard so far? And, you know, what do you think about somebody who has this kind of personality, but apparently, you know, Rishi doesn't move without asking his advice first, operating at the heart of number 10? Well, I, I think power attracts psychopathy. And there, and I'm sure that our Dr. No or Dr. Strangeheart or Francis Urquhart or whatever code name <laughs> we're giving him, uh, it's like a real house of cards. Is not alone in um, in you know displaying these uh, this types of uh, personality. I mean, as we were talking about one aspect of it, Westminster is not a particularly nice place with respect to how the you know harassment and so on of staff. But also, this attracts people that are attracted to power, and they will act in quite strong ways. I'm interested to see more about the book, because, of course, you know, I think that um, our politics is rather controlled, but I'm interested to see the ways in which you think our politics is, oh, it's, is it's rather controlled. It's very much controlled. Now, I've made the point over and over again that people believe that when they go to the ballot box, that that their vote makes a difference and it doesn't make any difference at all. And that was in the research that I undertook when I was writing this book, it's, that was the biggest shock to me because coming from my background in a council estate, all you have is your vote to affect change. In that vote lies all your hope. And, and actually when people think power flows from that ballot box into Westminster, it doesn't. Welcome it's to the revolution, Nadine. On the way. Well, well, I'm, I'm going to disagree with both of you now. <laughs> James, look, of course, we don't have a perfect democracy, but the idea that what you vote for at the ballot box doesn't make a difference, of course, well, maybe it makes a difference. Who you what vote happened for, in uh, who you you know, vote at the referendum? We voted for Brexit against the political establishment's wishes. We got it. Thatcher changed the country by winning three general elections. Boris could have changed. This is where you and I really disagree, Nadine. Boris could have changed the country if he governed well. He didn't. He, of course, there are shadowy figures in Number 10, and you're right to expose them. They've been in the Conservative Party far too long. But you know the person who orchestrated Boris Johnson's downfall most of all? Boris Johnson. He wasn't a good Prime Minister for all sorts well, of reasons. Well, we are going to... We're not going there, because you and I are going to fight till the cats come home <laughs> on this one. But what I would say is this, Tim, is that... You mentioned Margaret Thatcher. There have been prime ministers, Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, Boris Johnson, where people have gone out and voted as much for the person as they've gone out and voted Absolute. for the and party. Also, we're more and more On presidential. On my council yeah. estate, I remember running with other kids after a car, shouting Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, with the car and the tannoy. And it must have been, I don't remember when it was, but there was a tannoy on the top of the car. It must have been... This was in because, Liverpool. No, were... so this was, this is not me. This is the, the kids in our close. Oh, this was, um, was it 83? Maybe. Was it? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. So the kids in the close where we were living, running, shouting Margaret Thatcher after the car. And the reason why I was running, because I was babysitting, well, anyway, that's another story. Um, <laughs> and I remember that very clearly. And there are, there are individuals, characters that people will vote for. And, and I think one of the problems that we have now is, you know, they voted for Blair. They didn't vote for Gordon Brown. This has been going for some time. They didn't vote for Gordon Brown. They didn't actually vote for John Major. John Major, Labour lost that election. John Major didn't win it. And there is this, it's much more now about the individual. So I think there are those shadowy figures, they know that. And I think they use that to their own, to their own ends. And, you know, Ian Duncan Smith, great, great person, removed. And I, th and I think those shadowy figures have far more power than mm. people realise. And it wasn't well, was just Ian, a movie. I was Ian's chief of chief staff, of staff but you were leader. right there in the middle of And a of lot it. of those people that brought Ian down, they're still in the Conservative Party. They're I the same people in Ian's... Well, I probably shouldn't read all what's in the book, actually. But they're the <laughs> same people who brought... Bar exactly the same people who brought Boris Johnson down. These are the men down. in grey. So the the and men these, in grey suits. Well, actually, no, I will say these are Ian's words. The same people who removed Ian as leader of the party, removed Boris Johnson as prime minister, and, and had a role to play 
in David Cameron and Theresa May. You know, we've had five... What about five, Liz Truss? Did they bring down Liz Truss We've as well? had... Well, you need to read the book, James. We've had <laughs> five prime ministers and the people have been removed and the people have not had a say in that. So you cannot Definitely. say, you cannot say that democracy is thriving and doing well in this country when we have but, but prime neither minister is it nothing. after neither prime is it nothing. minister. No, and I'm the biggest defender of democracy, but we have had prime minister after prime minister after prime minister who has left office and been replaced that people in this country have had no say in that person being in that position. James. Yeah, I mean, I, I would go much further than in terms of democratising our politics, opening it up, than just that there should be an election every time there's a change of prime minister, although I think that's also a perfectly, a perfectly reasonable thing. I mean, we have problems with our electoral system. We have problems that lots of decision-making is completely removed from, uh, from politics. The decision-making of the Bank of England, which is extremely important to your viewers at home, for their mortgages, for cost of living, those that's not politically debated because it's removed from politics, and we see that in a whole number of areas. And um, you know, part of the impulse for at least some people behind Brexit was to have more direct, you know, a democratic say within our parliament. And, and I ha hate to say that there's not a tremendous amount of that that's happened. In terms of Brexit, there's no point us going over that now because, you know, we've had those arguments. I think the debate at the moment is about what's happening with democracy in our country at the moment. We've had a party that's been in power for so many years and yet so many prime ministers that people haven't voted for, decisions made, made that people haven't voted for, a manifesto that people voted for in 2019, which has been completely abandoned. Absolutely. There is, there are so many issues which are happening right now. And do you know what, James? I think that even if Keir Starmer, which he's probably going to win the next election, I'm very sure of that, if Keir Starmer wins the next election, I know people are thinking it's going to be different under Labour. I think one of the biggest malign forces in politics in Westminster at the moment is social media. And I'm not sure that it actually will be any different for Keir Starmer. I think he will start to have very quickly his own problems within the Labour Party, whether that comes from MPs or from others, because as a result of social media. That brings us to the end of tonight's show. Thank you for joining me and thank you to James and Tim. I'm back at 8 p.m. next week and it'll be a show that you won't want to miss. I'll be talking about the most anticipated political book of the year with revelations that will be sure to rock Westminster to its very core. Oh, and by the way, it's written by me. See you then. Good night, everyone. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about Tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and 